Well, good morning, everyone. Just like to do our announcements, and uh, a bunch of them are on the back of your bulletin, and you can take a look at that, take it home with you, have it as a reference. We also have uh, chat and coffee. We want to thank the Wilsons. They're out back right now at getting that all set up. Our flowers here in the sanctuary are offered by real folks, and that's for the strength of our church. If anyone would like to purchase gift cards for Stop and Shop and Big Y, Linda is right there. Also, um, we did send out um, an email, and it has been on our Facebook page. I think we mentioned it last Sunday. I'm going to mention it again. Even though December 15th seems like a long way off, we have to think about getting tickets if there's an interest. Uh, Hanover Theater is in Worcester, and they have a 2 p.m. Saturday production of A Christmas Carol. Uh, we can get a discount. I think it's 10%, and it's even more for students. I think it might even be 50% for students uh, from the general price. So if we are going to go, though, we can't wait till like November 15th because the tickets will be gone. So if you are thinking at all about the Hanover Theater production of A Christmas Carol on December 15th, please let me know. Um, once we get our 10 people, um, I'm going to place the order um, and we're going to go from there. So if you are interested in A Christmas Carol, please make sure to let me know. The deacons will be meeting tomorrow evening at 5 p.m. Bible study will be taking place on Tuesday at 7 p.m. as we're reading through Mark's Gospel. Any and all are welcome to attend. The choir will rehearse on Thursday at 6.30. And our chicken barbecue is on Saturday. Want to say anything? Our chicken barbecue is on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, we, we have quite a few volunteers, so that's, that's great. Um, we still need one more person in the, uh, as we say, in the pit, which is uh, to cook chicken on Saturday. Uh, so if anybody feels like volunteer, it's a long job, and it's, uh, it's like from 12 to 4 when you just sit in the smoky backyard and flip chicken on the grill on the, uh, on the giant fire pit. So. Uh, if anybody feels like volunteering for that work, that's still available. We also need coolers uh, to transport the chickens and to store them as they are uh, uh, dished out for takeout. So if anybody has an extra cooler, a big one that they could donate for the day, uh, please see me after church. That would be great. Thank you. Well, Mark, that sure wasn't the best way to get people to come to the pit. The way. <laughs> but remember, it's for church. It's for God. Um, so, and you could always make the joke while you do this kind of stuff, then you don't get the other fire pit later stuff. But we won't go there. All right, and next Sunday, though, is a very important meeting. It's uh, an all-church meeting to uh, discuss our proposed budget, and that whole process begins and takes on a little wider range when we bring in all the church. So next Sunday, after church, the all-church meeting to discuss our proposed budget. Uh, does anybody need any to say anything about the proposed budget? No? Okay. All right. Um, are there any announcements from the congregation? For the chicken barbecue. Linda has tickets for the chicken barbecue. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep. Mark is back here reminding me to turn the mic on. Thank you. <laughs> um, there will be a music concert here in the church, which is free of charge, on October 7th. It was supposed to be coordinated with the fall festival, but I'm told um, that there won't be a fall festival this year. We will go ahead with our concert at 3 o'clock on October 7th, and it's a concert done by the Jazz Bones. It should be really good. Um, so invite people that aren't here to come with you. It's open and free to the public. Um, and I also have some flyers, so if you're going to be out and about ta town and you'd like to post some of these up just so we can get it advertised a little bit better, I would really appreciate your help doing that. Thank you. Any other announcements? Oh, Anthony. Next week, we are going to have a guest cellist coming, so spread the word and look forward to that. Um, what's his name? Rostopovich? Carl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wish. Okay. Yeah. All right. So next week at Chalice. Beautiful. Any other announcements? Seeing none, 
I asked our, our talented organist uh, how to pronounce the prelude, and I decided I'm not going to try. I'm just going to go with the English translation of a piece for organ in C major. Thank you. So wherever you are on your own spiritual journey, you are welcome here at Hatfield Congregational Church to join us who are other fellow travelers. Um, and speaking of traveling, yesterday Sharon and I, we headed out to uh, Boston and we went to see Hamnet, which is uh, a play that we saw out there. And uh, Hamnet is Shakespeare's son who died at the age of 11. And the, the boy who is the actor is on stage basically by himself for the entire play. And he started doing this at 11, and now at 14, he's aging out of the part, and they're bringing in a new 11-year-old. And I can't memorize anything for the life of me. And I'm just sitting there watching this kid up there for an hour plus uh, doing the soliloquy, traveling the world, you know, strange audiences, you know, professional theater goes. You go there and you can tell who's always at the theater. And the kid was amazing. Um, and so it was a wonderful experience, and we also, since we got there early, we met our eldest daughter, and we were uh, walking around Boston. I always like to go to the, the Granary Cemetery, and uh, they have all the, some of the Patriots' graves there. I always like to go see Sam Adams. He's one of my favorite, and throw a penny on his grave. And right next to it is the Park Street Church, which is part of the UCC. And uh, the Park Street Church was, was locked, and I said, oh, that's too bad. I'd love to see what it looks like inside. And Sharon says, well, tell him. You're the Hatfield Congregational Minister. So I went, and there was a, a nice little lady behind 
the glass behind the locked door, and, and I said, is there any chance that we could get in to see the, uh, to the church? I said, I'm the Hatfield Congregational Minister. <laughs> and so uh, she was very kind. She let me in. Uh, the custodian there took me around, and, and he pointed out that the uh, guests that come in for the tours can only go so far. But because I'm the Hatfield Congregational Minister, I got to go right up front, took some pictures and everything else. And uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful church in the heart of downtown Boston. Um, but as I was there, I got to tell them that they're only a baby. Uh, 1809. We're from 1670. And so I told them that if they're ever out in Hatfield, you know, on a nice autumn drive, to come by Hatfield Congregational, and I'll make sure to uh, show them our church. So that, that was a nice treat for me yesterday. And for the, I don't know about them, but for me it was to go to the Park Street Church. So now that we are here at the Hatfield Congregational Church, because I'm the Hatfield Congregational Minister, let's go to our call to worship. Draw near to Christ, and he will draw even closer to you. And blessed are those who find their delight in Jesus. Knowledge of God is a delight to the righteous. They seek to grow in wisdom and understanding. Put your trust in God as you prepare to follow Jesus. Learn to be peaceable, gentle, and merciful, adhering to his example. Praise be to God. Amen. Let us join together in our unison prayer. You watch over us, O Christ, and show us the way to prosper in life, not so much in things as in relationships that contribute to our wholeness and well-being. Thank you for meeting us here and helping us to deal with our conflicts and distractions. We submit ourselves to your instruction. Help us to be honest with ourselves and with you voicing our doubts as well as our faith as we strive to build a genuine faith, creating us a space for quiet listening and thoughtful meditation. Amen. All right, let us raise our voices to God. Blue hymnal number 241, Holy Spirit, Truth Divine.
one of the themes of our gathering today is going to be interconnected, interconnectedness. Um, that's going to come out beautifully when the choir sings Be Not Afraid, and it's also going to come out right now as we share the gift of peace with each other. Could I have our young people come forward? All right. Howdy do. Okay. So we're talking about interconnectedness today, about how we're coming together as a community, which is part of church, which is part of Christianity. And I once was told the story that you can feel more alone in a crowd than you can ever feel alone all by yourself. Um, some people may want to go to be alone somewhere. They may want to walk the beach by themselves. They may want to walk the woods by themselves. And you don't feel alone like that. But I heard that the, that the most powerful feeling of being alone is in a, and this kind of rang, it kind of rang a bell with me and so it kind of stuck with me is when you're going into a school cafeteria people everywhere all these kids that are there already and you've got nowhere to sit you can be absolutely alone surrounded by people and it's a horrible horrible feeling um, that idea that there's all of these people and you have nowhere to go and so we're going to be talking about that throughout the service today. Um, but there is something else I'd like to, to lead up to that. Um, any of you guys re real Red Sox fans? You watch the games and anything like that? No? Not, not Red Sox fans? Well, I am. And um, where's Mary? Oh, Mary's up here now. Okay. Um, so Thursday, they had a chance um, against the Yankees to, uh, to clinch their division. And uh, so they were playing the Yankees. And, and I don't like the Yankees, though. So um, it was like a win-win situation if the Yankees lost and the Red Sox won. And on Thursday, they did a kind of cool thing on the radio. They took the Red Sox announcer, Joe Castiglione, and they put him in the Yankee booth. And they took the Yankee guy and put him in the Red Sox booth. And so in the fourth inning, the Yankee announcer on my Red Sox station got to announce a grand slam from the Yankees. I got so angry listening to this Yankee announcer on my Red Sox station getting to brag about the grand slam from the Yankees that I turned off the television, I walked away, and I read a book instead. So the Red Sox weren't doing what I wanted to do, so I turned off the station and I left. My daughter, who's younger than I am, a lot older than you, but a lot younger than me, she toughed it out. She stayed and watched the game. So she told me, you got to come back. I started watching again in the eighth inning, and they won. And so they won the division on Thursday night. But when they needed me, I walked away. I gave up on them. Think about that, because the gospel story that we're going to read today is the disciples. Jesus needs them more than ever. He's talking about, I'm going to die. And they don't know what to do. And Jesus says, I'm going to die. And they pull back. They pull away from Jesus because he's not doing what they want him to do. And they pull away from Jesus. 
Jesus gets into his house. And after all of these guys have pulled away, there's a little kid, a little child, that comes and crawls up on Jesus' lap and sits there with Jesus. And that's that message of, of what a child is. The child isn't looking for what Jesus can do for that person. Like I was hoping the Red Sox could win that night. And when they didn't, I walked away. The disciples were waiting for Jesus to give them something. He was talking about suffering and death and they walked away. The child wasn't looking for something that was going to be given to him. The child just wanted to be with Jesus and sat on his lap. That's the gift that young people can bring and teach all of us. That idea of that, that youthful innocence of just liking Jesus for who Jesus is. Not what he can give you, but just liking Jesus. That's why it's so important. Like I heard, you know, about we have soccer practice going on today. It's really important that we don't allow other things to take children away from church. And I'm not blaming any student because my girls did the exact same thing growing up. But we have to try and change society when they would try to take children and their opportunity to be here away from children. Jesus loved that little kid sitting on his lap just because that little kid loved them. And little kids have so much to teach us about that innocence of faith. We can't let them take that opportunity away from a, a kid who wants to be here. So we appreciate every one of you who is here today. We appreciate the lessons that you show us because no one's forcing you to be here. You want to be here. We appreciate that lesson and we appreciate the fact that you love Jesus enough to give up a beautiful summer or uh, autumn Sunday like this to be with us. We learn from you guys and we appreciate it. Thank you.
Beautiful, thank you very much. Time for our joys, our celebrations, and our concerns. Uh, prayers for Charlie Kellogg. Many of you know is a resident right here of Hatfield. Um, he had to be transferred to Mass General Hospital in Boston. Um, and I got an email last night, I believe, from his daughter. He is holding stable, but he is still in serious condition, so please keep Charlie in your prayers. Also prayers for two dear ladies who are friends of mine, Jane and Peg up in South Deerfield who are struggling with cancer and its treatments, and um, Jane is actually on hospice care now. Prayers for R. Sue Gilman, who is undergoing treatments for her cancer. Prayers for Glenn and Denise Wagner in their times of need and of healing. Prayers for our Bernie Lamprin and for his health. Prayers for Muriel Kilbovich, recovering from a recent illness. Prayers for Lynn O'Masta as she is treated for her cancer. Prayers for the health of Jean Sheehan, um, also here, and uh, who is also recovering from his cancer and their, his treatments for cancer. Any other prayers, celebrations, joys? My friend's sending Natalie, she's got breast cancer, she's going through surgery now. Going through surgery now for breast cancer, Cindy Napoli, we'll pray for Cindy. And remember, if anybody needs the mic, Amy's got the mic in the back, and sometimes it's hard to hear. Linda? It's Tuesday. I, I don't know about the three surgeons, but I know it's uh, Tuesday. I'm going to go visit um, them tomorrow, and we'll keep them in our prayers. But um, yeah, it has been a long haul for them, Linda. You're absolutely right. Any other prayers, joys, celebrations? How about a joy? Anything? <laughs> Anthony, you're with kids all the time. How about a joy? You got any joys for us? How about telling us what, just you've got a prodigy kid you're training. How about a joy? Yeah, I'm starting this year with five piano students. So all right. That's good. That's a joy. I have to go. Thank you for offering that. <laughs> any others? Yes. Oh. Thank you, Mrs. Sheehan. Thank you. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Very nice. That's all fine. Just, just remember, I'm from up in frontier territory, so just remember that. Anything else? Thank you for those joys and celebrations. Um, so now, I actually had a request uh, that we spend a little bit more time in silent prayer because um, somebody told me that they didn't have a time enough to get through their prayers. Um, so let us join now in silence uh, to offer our prayers that we want to say privately to Jesus. Gracious God, reveal to us as we welcome children in the name of Jesus. Grant us a childlike openness and honesty to explore your word and your presence all around us. Let us have those opportunities that children can take advantage of to come here to be in your house. Teach us as Jesus taught the disciples so we may not so much aspire to prideful things as to faith-filled and as we sense your guiding spirit in what we do in your name, let us also know that you are always close enough to listen to our prayers said out loud and the prayers we keep inside. Please join me now in reciting the prayer that Jesus taught us to say, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. With our free will offerings, we will sacrifice to God, giving thanks for mercies too abundant to count, 
We want to share what has been entrusted to our keeping, that God may be praised and peace may come to all of his people. We accept the responsibility to support the ministry and mission of this congregation. We give so that Christ's work may continue, so please be as generous as we possibly can. Accept, O Lord, these gifts now be placed in your sanctuary as a symbol of our love for you and for each other. May you use these for your holy purposes. And as we stress today this idea of interconnectedness, may these gifts show that we are all one family, one community, all coming together to do your work. We thank you for your generosity. We ask that these be blessed by Jesus to accomplish his work. The Shakers are an uh, amazing religion that uh, has kind of faded from us, but one of their gifts that still remains is some of their hymns, and that is a gift, is tis the gift to be simple, blue hymnal number 568.
So the reading this morning is from James, chapter 3, verse 13, and it's on page 982 in your pew Bible if you'd like to read along. Two kinds of wisdom. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on pleasures. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts you double-minded. And our gospel is taken from the gospel of Mark chapter 9, verses 30 to 37. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know of this, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what Jesus was saying, but they were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest among them. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them. And taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me alone but the one who sent me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Did you ever hear about the fact that when giraffes chew on the leaves of an acacia tree, that the tree sends out a signal of ethylene gas to other trees? When the other trees downwind sense this, they begin putting tannins into their own leaves to protect them. In large enough quantities, these compounds can sicken or even kill a giraffe. And it's not only the scientists who know this, the giraffes know it too. So as they're eating those leaves, you know, hurting the tree, so as they're doing this, they browse into the wind so that the warning gas doesn't go to the trees where they're heading to, to eat next, it goes downwind to the trees that they've already eaten from. The trees are trying to take care of each other. It's natural. They're not thinking about it. It's not something that they have thought process. We're going to take care of our neighbor. They just do it because that's the way God has made our world. It's not about morality. It's not about a choice. It's taking care of each other. It's how we are made. It's normal. It's natural in the whole of God's creation. That is until human pride intervenes. And that's when Jesus has to remind us how to be normal again, how to be natural again, how to think about us 
instead of just thinking about me. Let's start with last Sunday. That's when we heard the gospel story of Jesus' first passion prediction. Peter was so offended, if you remember, that he pulled Jesus aside and Peter yelled at Jesus. This was that setting for that disturbing scene when Jesus has to say to him, Get behind me, Satan. And that's what we talked about last week. Today we now hear the second passion prediction. Mark tells us that Jesus and the disciples, that they're walking through Galilee. This is Jesus' home turf. He knows he will never, ever be able to return home again. Just think about that. I know a lot of you guys have ancestors that go back to the 17th century, but I'm only two generations away from my ancestors that came to America. And I think about the fact that when they left Europe to come over here, you know, it wasn't like having FaceTime on a computer. It wasn't like they could fly back and forth. They were poor and they were desperate. And so they knew when they came here, they would never go back home again. And I think about how sad that must have been to say that final goodbye. This is Jesus' final goodbye to Capernaum. This is not a preaching. This is not a teaching journey. He's trying to get through Galilee to get to Jerusalem to do what he needs to do and he doesn't want to attract any attention at all. This is not a time for crowds. Jesus is alone. We hear today that as they walk, the disciples are in conversation among themselves and that Jesus is alone, far ahead of their group because they're talking about things that they don't think he can hear. And after the get behind me Satan, well, the disciples are actually afraid to ask Jesus anything about this idea of what it means to go to Jerusalem and I will die and I will resurrect. So they pull back and they try to figure it out themselves. And you can just, if you can just picture that, Jesus is already alone in his thoughts. Now physically, he is actually alone walking ahead of the disciples. He is mentally alone, spiritually alone, and now he's physically alone. He's alone because the disciples do not understand what Jesus is talking about and they're too afraid to ask. And this is the exact opposite of the disciples as we have been talking about them as we study Mark's gospel and Bible study, which, by the way, we will do again on Tuesday from 7 to 8 if anyone is interested. But the disciples are the ones who stick around. They're the ones who ask Jesus questions when his teachings get hard and complicated. Others, they only hear the stories. They only hear the parables of stories. The disciples are the ones who stay around so that Jesus can teach them the meaning of the stories. But now they walk at a distance in physically, spiritually, everything. Jesus is alone. Now we can't delve into the mind of Jesus. That's impossible. How could, you know, when you talk about God, man, can you imagine what goes on inside of Jesus' mind? I can't. I don't think anybody can. We shouldn't even go there. That, that's something that belongs only to him and to God. But try and imagine as weakly and as simply as we can how lonely this must have been for Jesus. He not only has to ponder his own death, as scary as that has to be, because every Jew knew what that meant. That cross was a horrible, horrible way to die. It was public, so everybody knew what that meant. And Jesus has to ponder that, but he also has to think about the fate of his ministry. Has it worked? Look at these guys behind me. They're not getting it, and these are the only ones that have chosen to follow me. The other ones hear my stories, and then who knows what's going to happen. So it has it worked. Will anyone remember me? Will anybody remember what I'm saying? Does anyone get my gospel message? And Jesus has to struggle with this all by himself. Today, though, is the first Sunday of autumn. It's not the first Sunday of Lent. So we're not going to talk about just the cross. We're going to, this is a season of Pentecost. And in Pentecost, green is a sign of a living church, of, of growing in the faith. This is a season of learning. This is the church's season that develops the idea of discipleship, of following Jesus, of letting the Holy Spirit inspire us and guide us so that we can know Jesus ever better. So we need to look at this story of Jesus' second passion prediction not with a focus on where he's going to in Jerusalem, but rather as a teaching tool for us today, for Christian disciples today. That is who we are. And in today's gospel, I think we hear a lesson about interdependence. Not independence, but interdependence. About being mutually reliant upon one another, and that this is not a sign of weakness, that you have to rely on somebody else, but it is a sign of conviction in our faith. So let's talk about those disciples. Peter messed up big time at that first passion prediction, but at least his concern was for Jesus. He couldn't fathom the idea that Jesus would have to suffer and to die, and so he pulls Jesus aside and says, you can't talk like that. But the second passion prediction doesn't have anything as dramatic as get behind me, Satan, 
but I think it's even more damaging. Now, all of the disciples are only thinking about themselves. They're not worried about Jesus anymore. They can't figure out what he's going to do when he gets to Jerusalem, but they're figuring out some way he is going to go to Jerusalem and whatever that suffering is all about, he's also talking about resurrecting. So they're thinking somehow, some way, he is going to establish his kingdom on earth and they want their part of it. And as they trail behind Jesus, remember, he's up by himself. They're trailing behind in the group. They're mumbling these arguments back and forth and they're arguing among themselves about who is the greatest. Who will sit closest to Jesus' throne? Who will be elevated above all of the others? Who will have the most perks? Who will have the most privileges? Who will have the most connections and the most power and the most say? In a sense, they want to be all alone, but they want to be all alone up at the top. And Jesus is all by himself. Then in the evening, in Jesus' adopted hometown of Capernaum, sitting together, maybe in Jesus' house for the very last time ever, Jesus breaks the ice and asks his disciples, what they were talking about as they walked along the way. No one is brave enough to say a word, and I can't blame them. And when, since it's Capernaum, since Jesus is well known, others have gathered at the house too, and I think we can imagine a crowded scene. The neighborhood has gathered around Jesus because Jesus brings news of the outside world. Jesus brings the excitement of the gospel. They've gathered at his house. And since the disciples won't say a word in this crowded house, Jesus sits down. And then when he sits down, the, the disciples, as is their custom, they gather around the teacher. A child clamors up in between all of these disciples and Jesus and unplanned sits on Jesus' lap. Rather than shooing the child away, Jesus directs the attention of those disciples to the child. In Mark, this is not yet where Jesus says to them that they must become like a child to enter into the kingdom of God. Instead, Jesus has the disciples look at this child we don't know for how long. I wonder if it became embarrassingly long. I wonder if there was this pregnant silence and the disciples have to start thinking to themselves, why are we looking at a kid? What, what, what does a kid have to teach us? You know, he, the kid's nose is running. The kid is giggling. The kid is, why are we looking at this kid? And maybe Jesus just let that kid sit there and the disciples just had to look and wonder and ponder. And then he finally says to the disciples, you have to learn to be able to receive this child. These are men of 2,000 years ago. Children, they were women's concerns, not theirs. Children were the opposite of greatness as they imagined it. You know, children, their nose is running. That's not a sign of greatness to go over and wipe it. Power, prestige, impact, that's what power is. And that example of the child was Jesus' counter logic and he says to them greatness is not what we amass for ourselves it's what we do for each other it's okay to be dependent upon each other just like that child is dependent all the time now in your mind's eye take just a moment and contrast the image of Jesus all alone the disciples walking behind and then imagine how you will the image of that child on Jesus' lap and Jesus able to have physical contact with that baby, that little boy, that little girl. Jesus is holding that child. This is intentionally the first time in that whole story where Jesus is no longer alone. The disciples, just like I was telling the kids in a crowded school cafeteria, there's a lot of people around, but Jesus is alone. That little child finally brought contact into Jesus' life. He was not alone anymore because of the child. That's why it hurts so much as a pastor. And this is not only in Hatfield. I went through the same nonsense up at Frontier. Why do they have to do anything on a Sunday morning to steal kids away from the opportunity to be here? Why isn't this more important than a football game or a soccer game or a track game or anything else? Jesus needs those children here. And I think those children want to be here. And we as parents and grandparents and citizens, we really should speak up more because this should be a place that is filled with children. That child was the last time, the only chance in Jesus' whole journey there where he was not alone. This morality of interdependence, that's not all that strange. As that example of the acacia tree shows, it's natural to be, to be caring about other people. Jesus has only reminded us how we were created by God and in the likeness of God. 
You know, if we can't convince the world of this truth, because I'm actually sick and tired of hearing about the top 1% and the billions of dollars that they've amassed for themselves and they've hoarded for themselves, and they call that greatness, and they put their pictures on the cover of Forbes magazine. Let, you know, if we can't teach the world the real meaning of greatness, we can at least do it in the church. Let's make sure that our greatness is expressed as community and how we are interdependent. Let's appreciate our time together like this on a Sunday morning at worship and after worship at chat and coffee where we can laugh and talk and hear about other people's stories. Let's create more of these opportunities. Let's go together to Worcester. Let's go together for a Saturday afternoon matinee and laugh together. And let's not see that as stealing our free time. Let's see all of that as giving meaning to our time. You know, we tend to ignore history and the future nowadays. It's our generation that is only important. We don't care about too much about the environment, what's going to happen down the road for our children and our grandchildren. We worry about right, what, right now. We want cheap gas. All right? We don't worry so much about the debt. We don't worry about the children and the grandchildren having to pay it off. We want no taxes now. We don't, we want, we're not worried about the debt. We escape into digital worlds to hide for hours at a time rather than to join groups and come together as neighbors. We find it hard to empathize with the situation of strangers and immigrants. And no matter where we are, you know those, those pictures, those selfies. Um, Sharon and I are walking the streets of Boston. You've got to go around the people that just plant themselves in the middle of the sidewalk so they can do one of these selfies. It doesn't matter where you are. You could be by the Grand Canyon. You could be in the beautiful city. You could just watch a beautiful fall sunset. But who's the center of a selfie? Me. That's who we are. We are the center of everything now, even down to that selfie. We're intentionally isolated. And we have to know as Christians that the greatest of our calling is to fight against this isolation and to talk again about interdependence. So let's value our time together as a blessing. Not find excuses not to come here. Let's find excuses to go out and tell other people to come with us. Let us honor that gift of interdependence. And for this may we pray in the name of our Savior who held that little child in his arms and who that little child finally broke the isolation of Jesus and he felt connection to somebody and he felt the blessings of hope. May that child's example inspire all of us. And for this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So, our sending hymn is Red Hymnal number 464, Praise to God, Immortal Praise.
and he tricked me with that last verse there. Um, I do have a little sign-up sheet. We have a few people that have already mentioned interest to me in that Christmas carol, as I mentioned in the sermon. Um, if you'd like to go, uh, please let me know, and I'll write your names down, and we'll see if we get our 10. And like I said, once we get our 10, I'm going to place that order. Um, so I think there's a whole bunch of announcements that have been made, and I do thank you as we close in on 11 o'clock for sharing an hour with us here on a beautiful autumn, su uh, autumn Sunday. I hope the rest of your day is going to be just as nice as it was here in church. So may we now gather together for our benediction response. Let us go forth trusting in Christ and in each other. Live each day seeking to be more authentically Christian. The rhythms of prayer and service enrich our lives. Jesus' gentle spirit inspires us to good works and we can make a difference in our world. Jesus is ever watchful. He protects and cares for all of his people. In his embrace, our hearts are full and we feel the perfect love of God. This is why we trust in Jesus. In him we discover our strength and our dignity. He renews us day by day. In that same assurance, let us share the blessings of God with all whom we meet as we leave this sanctuary as his people.